Thank you for tuning in to Cop with Comic. I'm Brian Cop, and we're here with comic Mike Kaplan. Mike Kaplan, how the hell are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Oh, good. And real quick, everybody knows who the hell you are. So they're MikeKaplan.com, and you're probably Mike Kaplan across all social platforms. Uh, I am, and I also will not presume that everyone knows who I am. So uh, hello, <laughs> hello, <laughs> hello, new people to me. This is yeah. This is gonna be quite a shock to the people out there because our material today is just like he, It's almost like he can slip the worst shit in in a very very nerdy cloak. Oh, fair. Yeah, but meaning even 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 in your music, I think you get away with more. Uh, I mean, I don't I don't know what I'm getting away with. Well, but, it's a uh, lot, yeah, a lot of provocative material that could lead to certain blowback. I would think because you need know, touch on you know. I mean, I guess we'll get to but, you know abortion and rape and and you know God God might be gay because it was God and Adam and not Adam and Steve and things like that. I have I have said many things <laughs> along these lines. <laughs> And are you worried that this is going to interfere with your your uh, intention to run for president of the United States? Uh, I I think the answer to that is no. I <laughs> I do not fear that. You do not fear that for a couple of reasons. First of all, because you won't run. But uh, what you have coming up is not running. It's actually uh, you have another CD coming out called All Killing Aside. I do, and that's coming out in May. It is May. 2020. So if it's after that, you uh, you already could have it. So yeah. what, what do you do? Stop listening to this. Go <laughs> go get that. Then come back. You can feel free feel free to finish listening to this. What what you're you're in charge of your own time. I think you know. <laughs> Don't let. I'm not. I'm not your boss. Dude. And, and then how is this going to differ from the previous CDs? Uh, well, uh, all the jokes will be different. That's the main <laughs> thing. Uh, one one thing that is uh, different about it, or sort of has gradually been happening in the decade or so since I've been uh, putting out albums of my comedy, is I feel like the first album that I put out uh, was basically just, you know, I, I recorded it after doing comedy for seven years. I had at least an hour or so of material that I was happy with and, you know, would be headlining with or just starting to headline with. Yeah. and. They were just, you know, the best jokes that I had written in the past seven years wow. in in an order that made sense, you know, yeah. which isn't to say how good they were. They were better than anything else I had done, you know, better than I had been seven years earlier when I didn't have any jokes. Uh, <laughs> but then little by little, like uh, an album, the last album that I put out uh, had somewhat at least more of a theme to it that uh, it was all sort of based around the idea of not wanting to have children and I called it no kidding uh, <laughs> as a as a very funny title and because yeah. uh, I'm I'm a very funny person <laughs> and um, so that was you know it was fun to try and like build things off of you know one central idea and then this is the first uh, uh, sort of another step along the progression of doing that uh, where it's basically all it's it's very uh, specifically and tightly structured in a way, and it's almost all. About, it's not just you know I've I've written some funny jokes that I'm like well this doesn't go here because it doesn't go with the the themes of which so the title is all killing aside and yeah. it's a lot about you know not murdering like that's my uh, it's, uh, one of my passions is. Uh, <laughs> is not murdering and so you know things like gun control things like veganism things like psychedelics okay. and just sort of love death philosophy uh bathroom etiquette there's a lot of uh, a lot of different topics all uh, springing from the same well and so yeah i would say it's specific things that i like now that i have been doing comedy for uh, a number, a number of years that's higher than the previous number of years. Right. Uh, like I, I now understand that I, I can't. Like in the beginning, I really didn't think that I could make jokes about just whatever I wanted to. You, yeah. It just you didn't, you don't know. It, I didn't know what I was doing really in the beginning. Just ideas would come and be like, oh well, this joke's about a movie, and this joke's about my personal life, and this joke's just a silly uh, thing about how words sound, and this yeah. joke's about a social issue that I care about, and they would all pop up equally, and I would I would try them all. I was very egalitarian, right. and so you know the final product, which is still the way it, you know, these are still the way uh, that jokes like sort of come into being is whatever I. Uh, whatever pops into my mind, whatever I consider, but also now I understand that if I spend more time, you know, focusing 
uh, facing in one of those directions, you know, steering the ship. Like, I'm not in charge of the wind, but I can, you know, move the uh, hoist the, ma- I don't know, sailing uh, te- <laughs> terminology. I've, right. I've, I'm not an expert in that, but I, okay. I know for sure there's an analogy there. If you, <laughs> if you're, uh, know, if you know about sailing, then uh, le- a jib, uh, mainsail, uh, d- d- I, like, I like hoist. I know that one's a verb. I know there's not a hoist on the boat, I think. Yeah, I, think I think hoist on your own retard or something like that was one of your bits in the, in the past. It was, yeah. and uh, that, w- that was a, a punchline, uh, so you don't need to listen to that one anymore. But uh, <laughs> is it okay that we burn your material? Are we assuming that you're, it's your fans listening? So I can bring up references to your catalog. I hope. I mean, we, you can make whatever assumptions you want. I would okay. say that there are fans of mine who don't even who haven't listened to everything okay. that I've ever done and said. I don't mind you referencing jokes, though. Yeah. Also, I will take this moment to say that there are some jokes and some topics that I would not do the same way now. Okay, uh, like that one. In in particular, I might like. I, it's not to say that times have changed and it was quote unquote okay when I said it, <laughs> but I have you know different experiences now, and so you know we can you know, as a as an American, right. as a human, ideally as a as a comedian, like we can say what we want to say, yeah. uh, and also that doesn't mean that you just do say everything that you ever could say. You right. you can't say two things at once. You always, if you're saying something, you're not saying something else. Right. If you're talking for an hour, that means that there are other, you know, for every joke that ends up on an album, I probably have 10, 100, 1,000 jokes that don't make it to the album. Wow. And so the question is, which are the ones that I'm like, this is my favorite, this represents me yeah. and who I am and what I think is funny and what I believe and what I want to present. And so that particular joke, and and I have a, a higher bar for certainly some specific topics. Like I will talk about, uh, you know, like things that, like you said, people might uh, find let's say, you know, quote unquote, controversial. Yeah. But like I, if I'm talking, let's say, like I have some older jokes about sexual assault that yeah. I don't think are, you know, they're, they're, they never came from a place of, you know, making fun of victims or I, I wasn't intending to make light of the topic, but just by virtue of the fact that I, a person who really had no connection to the topic, like, you know, if somebody has experienced an assault and, they want to talk about it in their art. Like, that seems very appropriate. And yeah. as somebody who hasn't experienced that, I can talk about it, but I think it's there's a there's a higher bar that I have for myself to uh, to determine, like, what am I going to be saying about this thing? Like, uh, is it funny enough? Is it uh, helpful enough? Is it valuable enough in some way? Uh, and not just, you know, like, a, a, I feel like some of my older jokes were more... Like silly tricks and yeah. s- silly tricks are fun, but if they're <laughs> silly tricks on top, you know, about topics that uh, can make people feel uh, particular ways, like it's not to say don't tell those jokes, but it's to say understand that when you tell those jokes, uh, they might make people feel ways. Like you can't be. It, there's some people who are like, I'm going to be a con. I'm I'm going to set out to offend people. I'm going right. to be a controversial person uh or figure or comedian and then they might get upset when people react to the thing that they said (laughs) which was the whole point of they're like i want to be controversial and i but i don't want any controversy that's uh that is what some people seem to be saying thinking feeling acting like and i if i'm talking about you know a topic that uh, Especially if it's something that is a is really impactful in people's lives, then I want to make sure that in addition to it being funny and like true to myself, it's something that is important uh, for me to be saying. Yeah, and I think one of the, I mean, you know, and even the retard word, it's like I, I almost think a Mike Kaplan could bring up the word retard even now, and then do about fifteen jokes about why it's totally inappropriate. And uh, then, and then yeah. even with rape, I think you know, you said, well, you know, I don't like rape. But, oh, except you know, raping the rapist or something like that. That That is a thing that I put on a CD yeah. 10 years ago. And I, I think I, that makes, I think that's fine, right? Uh, I mean, in one way, I can understand why you're saying that. <laughs> I, that is a joke that I wouldn't tell that way again, in particular, because I was talking about, like, first, I wouldn't throw around either R word as lightly as I did in the past. Oh. Uh, just because I think that it is something that, uh, it, it in to in my in my own this is for my my own guidelines for myself uh, needs to be earned like uh, I'm not just gonna say like there's tons of words like there's certainly words that 
I feel like you won't say as that anybody, most people won't say as freely just off the top of their head, like, hey, what are words that might upset people if you just say the word rape, without any context? Rape and I'm, not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah. asking you to say them, uh, <laughs> just to be clear. And uh, and I'm, I'm not asking you not to, but I <laughs> but I am using this tone of voice and implying, you know, I feel like you understand. Yeah. Uh, but the topic, that particular joke about, you know, if let's say uh, I, I were to say it now, like there actually is a new joke on the new album that is on a similar theme. Okay. Um, but I don't. I, I I feel like I don't need to use like any particular like I, the language that I'm using is is one thing and then the message that i'm expressing is another thing and the message of that joke that if there are people if that i would be for sexual assault on people who have committed sexual assault like people who are in prison like in the truth of the matter is like that's not what i believe like i want nobody to be i sincerely want nobody to be assaulted even if you have committed an assault i am anti you being assaulted particularly with you know the systemic problems of prison like there are people in prison for all kinds of reasons from yeah. no reason to yeah. you know down the spectrum of quote unquote good reasons right. but uh, there's so much like just the idea that you know sexual assault in prison is a punchline to some people <laughs> is something that I again, I have I I wasn't aware of how you know I wasn't thinking about it as a real thing and it's a real thing and I think warrants real thought when broaching it as a topic and then have you you know since these th- you know First of all, who could make that joke? You know, like, you know, there's not many comics who are also convicted of sexual assault. And so, I mean, like, you know, if, I mean, if there's you more are, and more today, but yeah. yeah, but I mean, if there is a, you know, if you're setting the standards so high, you know, what can you joke about? I suppose you can joke about being Jewish, which you do. And just to be clear, okay. I'm not saying that you have to have the experience to joke about it. Okay. I'm saying that if you haven't had the experience, it's good to think about the people okay. who have had the experience yeah. when you're writing about it. A hundred percent. Talk about anything you want. Right. Okay. And then as far as provocation goes, you know, it sounds like you are comfortable at least with, you know, provoking people with, with some of your jokes, although that not, might not be the main goal. Um, have you? Received- oh, yeah. I would say it's not a goal at all. Well, I mean, I would think. I mean, a lot of your material, though, it doesn't shy away from it, though, right? No, I'm. Okay. I'm not. Uh, I'm not trying not to provoke. I mean, like provoking isn't the framework in which I am like conducting the creation of the comedy that I'm doing. Okay. Like I'm thinking about, uh, like again, the things that are funny to me, the things that are meaningful to me, right. uh, the things that are present in my life and the things that I think are uh, important that, to talk about, maybe things that are different and or unique about me or things that are, you know, potentially similar to me that other people uh, might have might have experiences as well. And so the, and the fact is, obviously, everybody has different experiences, right. like as individuals and as groups of people. So there might be things that I talk about as, you know, as a Jewish person, that if I talk about my experience with that as compared to my understanding of other people's faiths, cultures, uh, and ways of living, there might be people who are sensitive to just the idea. You know, there are people who believe that Jews are going to hell. And so there are people, like, I've definitely talked about being Jewish on TV, and some of the comments, you know, in under the YouTube videos uh, have been, like, you know, enjoy hell, burn in hell, like, why uh. do you have to talk about being Jewish? And so those people are being provoked. I'm certainly not setting out to do that. That yeah. is just, you know, uh, an aspect of who I am that people have uh, different experiences that... I'm certainly not going like I'm not think I'm not thinking when I write a Jewish joke I'm like boy this will really get people <laughs> who don't like Jews to feel bad like I don't want them to feel bad I want them to like themselves I want them to you know like respect allow you know tolerate like ignore forget about me yeah uh, but uh, yeah I'm not going to I I mostly don't think about uh, hateful people or people you know troubled people people. When I'm when I'm like oh who like who is going to I think about 
do I like the joke? Do I care about what I'm talking about? Do I think it's funny? And then I'll try it. And then if if every once in a while I might be mistaken and, and somebody's like, hey, this joke makes me feel away. I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of that thing. And do you uh, stop telling it? At, the, at what point do you stop telling it due to the blowback? Um, well, I the, the even the word blowback feels like uh, more aggressive than anything that has specifically happened. I think okay. the reason that I would stop telling a joke is if I... Uh, if somebody presented an idea, let's say, so I, I tell a joke, I think it's okay to tell, I think it's, uh, that the, it, it quote unquote shouldn't be a problem, but let's say there's something about it that I'm not familiar with. Okay. Uh, and if somebody makes a point to me like, hey, have you thought about this aspect of it? Like, here's, here's a particular, uh, a joke that I put on Twitter once, which was uh, when Chelsea Manning uh, had just come out as Chelsea Manning, and previously we had... Uh, known her by another name. And so Chelsea Manning was a new name. Uh, it was Peyton Manning before, right? It was not. Uh, that is a football player. And uh, I know a lot of stuff about different Mannings. <laughs> um, but I remember, so this is, uh, I this is like, I don't know how many years ago, but I certainly wasn't as uh, familiar with uh, the concept of uh being transgender as much as I am now. Now, obviously still not as much as some other people's experiences, but there's uh, there's a lot more in the culture now to be aware of. Right. And uh, But at the time, I thought I was just making a neutral joke that uh, Chelsea Manning used to go by the name Bradley Manning. Oh, okay. And so I said uh, on Twitter something like, maybe more like Bradley womaning. Because I was like, oh, this is a person who is identifying as a woman now, and they have man in their last name. That's uh, great. And so I thought that that was, like, I thought that was fun. And that, That's a name joke. It's not even tr a trans joke. But, and here's, <laughs> here's the thing about it, is uh, I learned from some people, like, it got shared uh, amongst people who, like, by people who, who like me, but then have larger fan bases of people who don't know me. Um. And so somebody responded that uh, that joke uh, caused caused them uh, this problem okay. that I was now, like, Chelsea Manning's name is Chelsea Manning. It's not Bradley Manning. That's uh, what's known in the community as a dead name. And so dead naming somebody uh. is like misgendering someone. Oh, and cool. they, they, expl they explain their perspective that that was disrespectful. And I was like, I agree with you. And, uh, you. and you deleted the joke. I did. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. And I think it, some of, there was one uh, joke where I think you were talking about, I mean, you were pre presenting a situation where you were talking about certain things on stage. Maybe it was uh, rape because you talked about uh, Scooby-Doo saying frat row, where rapes happen on frat row, meaning fraternity row. And oh, then you sure. said then you said that the people, you, you, you kind of disliked the joke after people came up to you afterwards and they were all fraternity bros being like, yeah, man, I was fine with the rape jokes. And so oh, it, yeah. it's almost like, you know, I like that you talked about it, if only so that you could criticize the audience who was um, really just responding well to the rape jokes. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that that is the only way that I would do that. Whatever joke that was, it might have been a, a different uh, one than that frat row one. There, so it, it, ha it has come up. Like these right. jokes, you know, they, they percolate to, to the top of the consciousness. And yeah. I, in the past, tried them. And I'm like, well, these these are funny to me. They work. And then that was like sort of a sobering experience. That really happened? Uh, oh, yeah, 100%. Wow, you got yeah. the, the audience response from, from the people who might have been responding to rape jokes in a very, they were almost attracted to the idea of In rape. a way that, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to. Yeah. If, uh, if there are, if some people are going to like them and some people are not going to like them, I don't want the, this is not the group of people. Like, I don't mean to, this might be a grandiose comparison. I don't mean to uh, say that this is in any way on the same scope or, or stakes, but my understanding of like when Chappelle stopped doing Chappelle's show, part of it was, I mean, his, his jokes, his sketches, like his ideas were clearly like anti-racist. He was clearly making fun of racism and like doing it in a very intelligent way in yeah. a very like, you know, a, a way that I think any reasonable person wouldn't misunderstand, right. uh, but there are some people who were not as reasonable. Yeah. And so... I think that he found himself uh, finding that he found that people were responding in ways that made him uncomfortable. He's like, I don't want to entertain people who are laughing at this non-ironically when yeah. it's intended ironically. Yeah. Uh, and that seemed like 
it's people were like, well, he's walking away from fifty million dollars, but if he doesn't want to be, he see, this is my interpretation that he didn't want to be paid to like entertain people who hated him or thought he was less than human. Yeah, uh, and so I think that's reasonable, and so I think in a in a similar way, I don't want to like I want to entertain people who are like I want to entertain myself. I want to entertain people who I love and respect. I want I want to entertain everyone but if i have to entertain a subset of everyone i want it to be the people whose opinions and respect and ideas uh are ones that are more aligned with mine as opposed to the alternative and and i think i get that with like the star wars joke where you said you know i think you were talking about you know first the option of getting with a mother and a daughter and you ended up wanting to get with a mother and you were talking about you guys being yoda level drunk and luke level drunk which was just hilarious especially the fact that luke's a whiny, whiny little bitch mm-hmm. and so meaning as somebody who doesn't watch the star wars thing you know you know the 85 episodes there are now you know i was content with the first two jokes being yes those are mainstream enough those are hilarious enough i get those and it was so funny because you kept the star wars bit going into x wing and episode 1 and all these things where you know maybe the last after was a little bit less, but you were like, no, I am a certain brand where I like the fact that there's a couple people in my audience who are enjoying these really, you know, even the less known Star Wars references. Uh, thank you. I mean, even more to the point, I was doing it for myself, perhaps more, <laughs> more than I mean, I'm glad if for, for anyone who did like them, like they were, they were jokes that it's very, it's rare that like no, like that. I would keep telling a joke that nobody likes, yeah. That, except for me. Every once in a while, it happens, and you're just like, "Oh, well, this this is good." You know, even if it doesn't get the same, you know, maybe maybe it worked exactly right once. And right. you're like, "Well, this then this is a good joke. I I like it, and aud- like audiences have liked it." Um, but yeah, I don't like audience response is not the sole arbiter of what jokes I keep doing good. and why. Good, and it's, it's cool because I think, you know, at the very end you might have acknowledged, okay, well, only some of you got those, you know, stayed along to the very end and those people thank you and then you did the equivalent of a Mike, that was almost the equi- equivalent of a Mike Kaplan stripe in the Tetris. You know, you, you said at one point where you're, the, the audience is hoping that there's going to be a stripe coming along like in Tetris where it clears out the whole joke. And so at the end of the joke, you almost acknowledge the fact that you were getting a little esoteric with your references. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, uh, I have a lot of jokes about <laughs> how esoteric Eric, my jokes are. Yeah, and I love that. See, I mean, sometimes you're even, you're kind of, I don't know if it's meta or breaking the fourth wall or whatever, where like even when you were talking about anal, you would talk about, you know, uh, the fact that you were talking about anal at the end when it's a better opener, meaning anal is opening and things like that. And but so, also it makes sense to go at the end now, thank you. Yeah, and then, yeah and then you also say, you know, everybody's, uh, well, you, said, you said something about people who are, you know, at the end, you know, everybody is another way in anal or something but yeah, I like the fact that you're you're kind of staying you know you're staying with the crowd where you'll comment uh, even on the order of a joke vis-a-vis the set order um, but w- one thing you know comics might listen to this because you know there's a lot of comics on here and they one, one truly impressive thing is is your writing like everything that you say can be a joke and one of the things that I, I thought was just miraculous was your scarecrow joke like you did a bit about uh, oh thanks you know the link and scarecrow between uh <laughs> the beloved Scarecrow in Wizard of Oz and, and to my mind, the hated villain in Batman who was Scarecrow. And, it, like, this joke was the only way where maybe I would like the Batman villain huh. is if he had been a Scarecrow, the scare, the lovable Scarecrow in w- Wizard of Oz. How the fuck did you write that? Like, uh, do, you, that, do, you, do, you, do you, like, once you have a Scarecrow joke, you're like, man, I got to Google Scarecrows now because there's an opportunity for cross-movie references. Uh, great question. I Now, this is a joke that probably I wrote Eight to ten years ago, okay. so I still holds up. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> I don't like. So my first answer is, I'm not sure because uh, because it's so long ago. Wow. I can't necessarily get back into the the exact state of mind, but I can I can speculate. Okay, I can say for sure I like the question that uh, I like the way that you asked. Like, did you just start googling scarecrows? <laughs> yeah, and I can I can assure you that uh, I did not. Okay. I mean, because it wasn't that I had a scarecrow joke. And then I was like, ooh, let me figure out, like, all these different Scarecrow things. It was, I realized, I mean, as, <laughs> it's funny, like, I, as simple uh, as it is that there is a Scarecrow in each of those movies. Wow. And they are very different. So with that, like, it's funny, if you haven't, if you're listening and you haven't heard the joke, now you you could hear it 
but you kind of know a little bit about what the joke is going to be. All right, I wrecked uh, it for you. Oh, yeah, but uh, we're here we are. I feel like this the, the episode should be called just like after the fact, you know, like <laughs> we should put up put up a content warning at the yeah. beginning of the show. Uh, be like, be careful. Do not listen yeah. unless you have listened to five <laughs> hours of albums before uh, coming into this or at least certain tracks. But I mean, it is like with anything uh, like I mean, you you write jokes. Well, yeah, I do. I'm not really a stand-up, though, yeah. But, uh, I'm an appreciator of jokes like Mike Kaplan's. Yeah. I, I appreciate <laughs> that appreciation. And, I mean, the, the idea is, like, how does anyone come, like, come up with any joke? Uh, sometimes you sit down and you're like, I want to write a joke about this topic. And so you either, you know, stream of consciousness or you do research or you whatever method it is that is working for you. Or sometimes you're just like, oh, like, I, I, probably it just occurred to me at some point that... Like, I mean, I think that perhaps that, I don't know when that, when that Batman movie came out, okay. but it had come out in the past, in the last several years okay. and brought that scarecrow villain, you know, more to the public consciousness, more to my consciousness. Yeah, yuck. Like, I didn't go Awful around. Awful villain, right? Yeah. yeah. I didn't go around thinking about uh, <laughs> that villain, the scarecrow, very frequently. Right. Uh, and, I, you know, and The Wizard of Oz, a beloved movie that I've known since childhood. Yeah. And so perhaps it was just that when the new scarecrow and, you know, like rose up in the consciousness, it like linked in a neural network, you know, with, you know, our brains. I took this cognitive science class in college that talked about priming and how if you hear like the word bug, then you'll be more you'll be quicker to recognize and like point out and think of other things that are bug related. You may like, uh, like spiders, insects, certain kinds of bugs, even like spy gear, other meanings of bug. Even if somebody like, look, there's a bug on the wall, you'll then still be primed for thinking like the, the network is lit up in your head yeah. for all the meanings and possibilities and functions of the concept of any kind of bug. Okay. And so similarly, maybe that is what happened with the like a scarecrow. I was, and my brain was just like, scarecrow, uh, what, what other scarecrows do we have on file? So <laughs> exactly I don't think I, one in popular culture. Yeah. yeah. I, wow. I, so I, it's probably it would have been like, in, in a way, like more uh, effective or efficient or more responsible to as a as a part of the writing process, as a part of the research, to do more than just Google within my own brain to be yeah. like, are there other scarecrows? You and know, I, and I think you might have done that with shit disco. Uh, it's possible that this <laughs> is going back a long way yeah, as well. Yeah, Th so, that certainly involved googling. Yeah, it's like you know, uh, can you Google some shit? And then Mike Kaplan, you know, thought it'd be funny to Google shit. And then he talked about you know the suggestive things. You know, Google will suggest certain search results, and he'll he hilariously revealed to us what happens when you Google shit. Which probably, if you do it now, you'll get different things because. <laughs> The algorithm is constantly learning, yeah. and, and who knows where the shit disco came from in the first place. But uh, and I almost think it might be the fact that you, you know it wouldn't show up in mine because I don't eat shiitake mushrooms, and that's you know it might be pe peculiar to my Kaplan. I, I certainly, it's. I mean, I do. I feel like in a way that like I feel like a lot of people have posted in the la in you know, the years since predictive <laughs> text and you know auto completions have happened. Like there are humorous auto completions and yeah. it's sort of like like a found like found art you know it's not like yeah. i didn't i didn't make it happen you know i was just i uh, i only played my role of i guess googling shiitake mushrooms enough <laughs> that that would come up uh but yeah I, I mean i was it's always i'm always gracious when <laughs> the universe or some you know somebody says something funny in front of you and they're not a comedian you see a sign that is weird something strange happens like that like oh well, I don't even really have to do any work on this other than you know report yeah um, it, it almost happened. feels too easy and why couldn't all the rest of the com comedy be that easily and like one of the reasons why the the scarecrow joke seems so hard is because you also had the bit about the Tin Man oh sure and like you know you're talking about axe murderer I was like what, what the fuck are you talking about he's one of the most beloved characters known to man and then you pointed out that he was heartless oh sure and then that's why it made sense like why the fuck wouldn't he snatch a heart if he was heartless and so then you know in that context I was like okay the scarecrow is a logical extension of that and then what the fuck he just went into Batman with his scarecrow and I just thought it was so brilliant and so oh. I mean like in one of those things like what you know it sounds like that was not that was more okay yeah you had the bug in your brain you had the scarecrow in your brain and of course you had Ask yourself, what are other scarecrows out there? But what is Mike Kaplan's writing process such that maybe other comics can steal it and use it as their own? I mean, a fine question. I One thing is, I'm not trying to be cagey, but everyone needs to figure out their own, their yeah. own way. Uh, but also, you can do that by 
uh, listening to people answering questions like this, which I'm <laughs> happy to do, not trying to keep any secrets. But uh, I mean, in that particular situation, I, again, don't remember like whether the scarecrow joke came first, the Tin Man joke came first, whether one of them specifically led me to the other or whether it started in two different places and then ended both in a place that like, oh, these things could go together okay. like now in order because they're on a similar theme, even yeah. though that wasn't the way it started. Uh, the way I think, I mean, I don't know where any specific idea starts other than uh, noticing something, noticing either something within or outside oneself, you know, uh, about a thing that you think that is, again, like, moving in some way, funny in some way, important in some way, like interesting in some way. And uh, like for me, the, the, the writing process now starts with just, you know, recording ideas when, when they come up. Uh, if something, there's this book I read, uh, I believe it's called Several Short Sentences on Writing. Okay. And it's uh, by, um, I think, a man named Klinkenborg. <laughs> and it's a fun name. Uh, but the book is re was really valuable. Like it, it's just... At the beginning of it, he says, uh, this is not a book that where I'm going to try to teach you how to write like me. He's like, this is a book where I'm going to try to get you to write like you. Yeah. And uh, I think like there's things in there, like this, there's one piece of advice that's like, uh, if a sentence volunteers itself to you, if you're like writing, like, oh, what a brilliant sentence this is that just came out of nowhere, uh, maybe interrogate that and be like, maybe it came out of nowhere because it came from somewhere. Uh, that <laughs> you you're like, stole, oh, you stole it from somewhere else. Yeah, just yeah. I mean, inadvertently, you, you might not know. Like these these things happen, uh, and so the the reason that I bring that up is just that I that he talks also about. Uh, noticing when you notice something like you know if you have an interaction with uh with a, a food service worker or with a with a retail person with a person on the street with you in any interaction like if something you know impacts you in a way that you remember it that you're talking about it later with you know a friend a family member another stranger like if something sticks with you like it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that everything that sticks with you is something that uh, needs to become a bit, but certainly more than things that didn't stick with you. Yeah. Those are the places to start. Be like, why did you remember that? Why did that jump out at you? Like, so Klinkenborg says, like, notice that you noticed something. Like, that's a that's a good starting point for creating any kind of art, whether it's you know, uh, lyrics or a book or a memoir or comedy. And uh, or I don't know if it's like for other things like dance. Be like, oh, I just walked a certain <laughs> way. I could use that in a dance. You know, and. So you start by noticing something, and then for me now, like I'll usually like in the beginning, I would just write write us you know write the sentences out and then go on stage and say them exactly like that. And now I will have the general shape of the idea that like at least one one funny thought about a thing, and then I'll bring it to the stage at a you know the equivalent of an open mic, you know, a show that where there's <laughs> like for I don't go to you know in New York there are open mics which are. Uh, often just sad places populated by comedians yes. looking at their notebooks, waiting to go on themselves, no audience. Yes. But what I mean is that there are some, some shows that I'm getting paid for yeah. uh, where I won't try necessarily brand new material. Okay. And then there are some shows where I might not be getting paid, where it's more of a, a workout room where experimentation is either encouraged or the stakes are such that like I'm like, this is the place where I get work done. Yeah. And so I go to that place, I talk out that idea, whether it's, you know, just one line that I have or something that I try to expand on and riff on. And then uh, I do that. I try to, you know, be in the moment as much as possible and create and live or discover really more, more of what it is. Does adrenaline help you there with that stage brain? Uh, I mean, I mean, more so than like writing it in advance, like do you have brain, you know, you might also have things that, you know, you can work in advance, like brainstorming, you know, okay, well, this, this is the thing I noticed and I'm noticing that I'm noticing it. What about this thing? You know, which angles can I look at it to make it funny? It sounds like you're doing that instead on stage. And is it easier because you have a whole room full of people hanging on every word and you're forced to come up with creative things? Uh, that's possible. Okay. Uh, I think that might be a component of it. Though I, I do think that the the brain or my brain, I only know about mine, I'm, and <laughs> if, if not even that, but certainly uh, if I know about any of his brain, it's mine. <laughs> and uh, if maybe yours is like mine, who can say? Uh, if this sounds like you, then I'm like, okay, I know about your brain too. So this is <laughs> like you. Uh, but the idea that performing, like when I'm performing, when I'm speaking out loud, 
uh, there are different parts of the brain that are active than when I'm writing. You know, oh. like physically, like it's a different action. So there must be like different neurons firing, different muscles, you know, being used throughout the body. And who knows what, like every, there's no way to be like, I'm just going to do the same thing over and over because you're different all the time. The circumstances are different all the time. But the, the reason that I, I like to start now I used to just write things down in a notebook. Now I start by putting things in a digital recorder. Like I speak, because I'm like, it's going to end up spoken. Yeah. So I start by speaking the idea. Oh, cool. Then I write the idea into my notebook. Okay. And then eventually when the notebook's full, I type it all into the computer at each stage, which is all a different action, speaking, writing, typing, uh-huh. and also separated through time. Like that, you know, I've now, when I said it, then later when I write it, I've had different experiences. Maybe I've tried it on stage. Maybe new ideas have formed uh, you know, within the, the same sort of network of ideas. And then when I'm typing it later, again, like more ideas will come. Wow. I do also sometimes like just in the morning uh, write, you know, uh, 750words.com is a website I like to go to ah. where it, you know, just encourages you to write that much of whatever you want, an email, a stream of consciousness, a list, a sketch, you, a can, book. Can you then email it to yourself or do you copy and paste it into Word? Like, I mean, you're putting it into their interface and then how does it get into your possession? Uh, I do. Like, you can you can always visit, you know, revisit it on their website, oh, but I do there. cut and paste it and and uh, and just you know put it in a file okay. and so I have like for each of the last several years since I've been doing it all of those like I don't usually go back and read through them much later but if something I'll read it after and be like oh did did something you know grow from here is there any gold to be panned and then I'll like take that put it into the recorder and then go through the process of the notebook the computer so there's a lot of like redundancies in place to potentially make sure that I don't miss any ideas right. because there are a lot of them and and it's fine you know there's there's enough that if I miss some like I've lost a notebook once or twice uh, <laughs> lost a digital recorder once like okay. it's it's a, you know it feels horrible in the moment but yeah. also like it's sort of uh, uh, I forget what it's like, but it's like something. <laughs> and uh, there's there's a book uh, that I don't want to spoil. That there's a part of it. It's, I guess it's like a starfish. You know, you a starfish loses an arm and then it grows back. And you you have it's not the arm that was there, but it's yeah. another arm. So you know, there's uh, I got enough starfish arms. <laughs> uh, and so I I do like the both processes of you know creating via you know just sort of free writing stream of consciousness like on a topic perhaps if I'm like you know if my new hour is about you know my relationship, relationships, marriage, like that's a lot of the themes that I'm talking about now. Uh, if I'm like, oh, I want to write a joke about what are the things like vows, proposals, like, so I'll just start, you know, going and then seeing, you know, what, what rises to the top of the consciousness and then what I can pluck from it and then bring that to the stage and then see what rises to the consciousness there. It's a constant sort of flow in and out of like blooming and then pruning. There's like you know, yeah. there's planting seed ideas and then watering them and, you know, you know, doing whatever, tilling the land. I don't know about sailboats or gardening, but uh, <laughs> eventually, like, something grows, and then eventually, you know, it's large enough, eventually, eventually, you know, you start pruning it and then shaping it and honing it, and then it's, like, a beautiful, you know, like, a sculpture made out of a, a plant. And you cut it down and you give it to Amazon for profit. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's one way. Well, and it's nice to know that you are using different neurons, you know, not only speaking into your own little personal microphone, but speaking on stage and also writing freehand and also writing, um, in, you know, typing into your computer, and is you know I, I think I read one of those stupid you know self help articles where there you know it helps to separate both the creative and the critical process and so when it comes to growing and planting seeds and then pruning it later oh yeah are you are you careful not to be too judgmental is your stream of consciousness such that you're just writing everything that comes to you and it's only later on do you get into your critical headspace I would say short answer yes okay. and long answer yeah <laughs> and that's somebody else's joke and I don't know who it is and if you know please tell me because uh, I love it so much okay. uh, I I, I wish I could give you credit. I've, I've been trying. I've been searching. I've been searching. <laughs> he, will, say, he, he or she will hear this podcast. Yeah, and I, come running. I hope so. I, hear, <laughs> I, I I like try to spread it far and wide. Uh, but yeah, it's such a funny joke. But sincerely, yes. But I, I also love that too. Where you're like, I was just trying to spread it far and wide and stealing your joke. I was hoping that you would come forward and tell me you're stealing it. I mean, <laughs> I do think that a podcast is the perfect place to, you know. Uh, do somebody else's Absolutely. uncredited joke. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it would be better if it was credited. Uh, and I certainly, uh, your point your point is taken. I do. Oh, it's I, not a point at I, all. No, it's just your hilarious. point. So I'm spreading it. Your point well. is taken. I mean, well then, if not your point, my point. Okay, like, there I, you go. The point that I'm taking yeah. from the <laughs> no point that you just intended <laughs> is that like there is a case to be made like, 
I if somebody was like telling my jokes without crediting me because they didn't know who I was, was like, oh, I love this joke. I don't know whose it is. Yeah. I, like I that certainly I don't mind that because they're, they're prefacing it with this is somebody else's and I love it. Yeah. yeah, as opposed to if somebody like creates a meme out of like a joke they see you do on TV and yeah. then explicitly, uh, <laughs> you know, cut out your your at symbol and yeah. and name or avatar or whatever. Like that is uh, that is less my favorite. Right. But uh, so I do. Yeah, I, I forgive myself for uh, doing a thing that the whoever created that wonderful joke might. It might not be their favorite, uh, but certainly they're not getting anything out of like uh, me telling people right. their joke. Like right. I don't think that they're like you know an angel gets its wings. Like something. What's <laughs> the, somebody must be talking about me because my joke notebook is tingling. You know, uh, somebody uh, somebody fucked a, ner- a bird and it was an angel. What was that angel gets its wings? I think you had a cool bit on that where a person went, a, a goat fucks a something and it becomes a devil. Yeah, a person fucks a goat becomes a devil. A person fucks a bird it becomes an angel. That does sound like the the concept of something that. I did say. Yeah, and I, and I guess when I um, so you are careful to separate the creative and the critical process. Oh yes, to answer your question sincerely, uh, yeah. we, we've that, you did you did a wonderful yeah. job of bringing us back. Okay. Uh, yes, I would say I, in some ways it is it might be like an artificial separation because sometimes like on stage I am both creating and then part of the creation process is responding to myself yeah. and to the circumstances of what's happening, and so. It, but then I will also then listen back later and be like, oh, like what, what would I do again? What can I do again? But yeah, certainly when I'm writing off stage, when I'm creating, I if I think something is worthwhile, like there's so many ideas that I record, there's so many ideas that I write down that I later look back and be like, of all the ideas that I could share, some of these I will not, yeah. just by because I. There is a limited amount of time that uh, this incarnation of self will have on stage. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll do as much as I can. Uh, but there are so many, you know, there's sometimes there's a choice between like honing a joke that I love more or like trying to have a new joke be born and, you know, hone that one. And so sometimes one choice is made and sometimes another. And I guess when it comes to that choices and you talked about, you know, for every joke that makes it on, maybe there's 10 or 15 that don't. And so one of the jokes where you were talking, it was the Wright Brothers joke and it was talking about, you know, what was before spoon, you know, when you spoon feed somebody something, here comes the airplane. And I think the setup you know, has been done before and, you know, some just some broad, you know, Seinfeld or, or something stupid like that. Well, you know, what was before? Here comes the the airplane. Oh, was, here comes the choo-choo. Here comes whatever. And so your premise was not not really novel and you didn't really go into it, but your your payoff was so incredible when you talked about having to explain to the audience who the Wright brothers were and the fact that you were spoon-feeding them a joke about spoon-feeding. At what point do you say, well, you know, the payoff is so good that I'll forgive, you know, a setup that might not be you know, as funny as the, as the payoff. And on the other side of the end of that spectrum is, I think you set up something where pickup lines at a funeral. And I was like, man, that setup is so amazing. I can't wait for the punch. And I don't think there was many punchlines to that. And I was like, oh, I kind of wish that that was so funny. I started laughing when you did the setup um, and he didn't actually deliver with 45, you know, Mike Kaplan can do 45 funny punches on that. So at both ends of the spectrum, like how, you know, whether a solid joke with a solid punch and a solid setup, you know, is that preferable to, you know, a, a le- less than perfect setup and a wonderful punch or a perfect setup and a less than wonderful, you know what I'm saying? I, yeah, solid I believe joke, yeah. I do know what you're saying. Yeah. I, I will also like first start by, you know, just uh, this will be potentially nitpickier than some might get. But it seems like based on the way that you're asking this, I think this will be a reasonable yeah. first uh, a, a foray into the answer is I would differentiate between the premise and the setup. Oh, okay. Uh, so I think that in some ways you might have used premise and setup kind of interchangeably. Yeah, that well, I was wrong, wrong. The premise yeah. is generally the topic. Right. So I think like the topic, which also, you know, sort of subsumes like the, the setup is part, it they're, they're related. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not that like the premise is the beginning. Right. Uh, the setup is the beginning. And the thing is, uh, so one, I think I... I I don't have exactly memorized what you said, but I think you said something like, you know, that setup, the setup to the joke about spoon feeding uh, itself wasn't as funny as, you know, other setups might be. But uh, well, it also, just was, just, it just yeah. wasn't novel. And the punch just was like, well, that punch was so worth it that I'm so glad he did it. I appreciate that. And I guess I, so my first, my, I guess now my second response, I'm not going to number all the responses, but <laughs> I've done at least two so far. Okay. Uh, I would say... You know, <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to I don't want to toot my own horn, but <laughs> I don't know if you maybe you've listened to my comedy 
too much <laughs> that you're expecting the setups to be funny. Yeah. Uh, be- and you're novel. like, hey, yeah. look at look at uh, look at all all your other. <laughs> It's like because a lot. I don't, I don't know if you know this. That normally, like standardly in comedy, the punchline is "quote unquote" the funny part. Yeah. Like that, the setup is the thing leading to the punchline. Yeah. I do. I do enjoy making a setup funny, and so this is where the differentiation is. Like there are some topics. Like there are well-worn topics in comedy. You know, yeah. like there's. Ev- it's even sort of well-worn to talk about some of the well-worn topics. Like if we're you know on stage and you're talking about you know airline jokes, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but also, there are funny things that still happen on uh, on planes with airline travel. And so to say, like, oh, that topic has been done, but has it been done like that? No. It's, in fact, I think in some ways more impressive when, I'm not talking about myself, when a comedian can, like, when a Brian Regan, when, uh, you know, a Patton Oswalt, when a Sarah Silverman or Maria Bamford, like, they're talking about, you know, sometimes universal human experiences that other people have talked about, yeah. but they are filtering it through their own uh, perspective in a way that it's, it, certainly, if something weird happens to you that never happened to anybody before, then like hopefully you can make something good about that. But it'll be an original idea, yeah. like from the get go. And uh, but and you're like, well, the the universe gifted me this thing. Then are you gonna? Will I do more work on it, or will that be enough? Just like here it is, you know, yeah. I pass it along. But so I like the idea that these that. When, if there can be a topic that, I think Nick Vatterot is a master of this as well. I don't know if you know Nick. I saw him at an open mic and oh. I was like, I just thought he was a New York comic, but I guess he's L.A. now. Uh, he does live in L.A. now. Yeah. He is, I think, uh, he was recently and maybe still is a TV writer. <laughs> uh, and But his, his stand-up is, he, he's one of my favorites. He is bananas. He is a, a super funny, weird guy. He doesn't act out where he's a video game character and he just walks into the wall. Oh, yeah. He even did that in <laughs> open mic. I was like, who the hell is this guy? He's amazing. Oh, he is fantastic. Check out his album. I think it's called For Amusement Only. Oh, okay. Uh, on the, the cover of the album, he is a pinball machine. Uh, he, uh, and, oh, man, I got a flip book of him acting out being the pinball machine oh, that had the, the album download code on it. I don't know if you can still get that. But, but I smile uh, just looking at that guy. But he is a guy who, I I love for this reason that sometimes like if you see a lot of comedy there are some topics that you be like oh this is these are common topics and then you hopefully you get different takes from different comedians but yeah. sometimes there's parallel thinking sometimes the same experiences lead to similar jokes but there if you don't see a lot of comedy you might not even know that a topic is well worn because if you only see comedy once a year once every yeah. however many months you don't you don't listen to it all the time you don't take it in like what Nick does that I love is like he presents jokes on topics that might be well-worn, but if you don't know the jokes, then you get the joke for free for the first time. You're like, wow, this is a new thing. And then if you're a comedian who's seen tons of things, potentially jaded about like, oh, this is a joke. Like he has this one that I love that I tell people uh, whenever I'm introducing him to people, I'm like, uh, not not in person, like, oh, this is Nick. And you might know him from (laughs) this joke that he tells. uh, The human pinball, right? As a concept. Um, he talks about, he's like, sometimes, I'm going to butcher the, the phrasing, but the concept is, he's like, you know, sometimes restrooms in uh, in businesses, like in a restaurant, they don't say, you know, the different gender names. Sometimes they might just say, like, you know, like like, like an animal. It's like, or, or uh, a di- and you have to try, like, I'm, dr- I'm trying to figure out. Like, <laughs> he's like, the other day, I spent 20 minutes in a hallway looking back and forth and being like, am I a kitchen or am I an exit? You know? <laughs> uh, and, and it goes on from there. Yeah. But like that, so I feel like the setup is something that a lot of people could have observed. The premise is something that a lot of people could have oh, observed sure. and come up with a similar setup. But I haven't heard anybody else take it to where he's taken it. Yeah. So I I am like without without again, I'm I'll toot somebody I'm like I'll toot Nick's horn and I'm like and Nick is uh playing the same horn that I'm hearing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll I'll toot toot and I'll also borrow that. Um so yeah, I feel like uh also uh, a fun point that as it turns out this joke was I don't even know this ended up being part of it, but the joke that began this topic uh of inquiry uh, is also about airline travel. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and I guess you you do a good a job job of that. Like you take things like the whole marriage and bestiality joke, where you I mean, you know I've heard before, of course, so it's not novel, but you know it's universal, so everybody will get the. Fuck everybody you. does uh, marry an animal. Yeah. That's correct. Well, yeah. well, they get what the fuck you're talking about when you say what's next after gay marriage, marrying an animal, and then you take it into no, it's just marriage. You know, marriage leading into bestiality, and so a lot of the things. You know, even when you're talking about, you know, oh well, maybe I'm thinking about vows, and I want to write some bits about that. It's because those things are universal and. and 
and you are extremely good at taking those things and, and I guess, you know, taking those things, making them funny. So even like something like the, you were talking about uh, the five year anniversary is this and the 10 year anniversary is this and the 80 years is, 80 years was oak and 90 years was granite. And you kind of related that to the materials that happen when you're 80 and 90 years old. And so, I, I mean, I like that because it's a universal and you made it funny. Are, are you kind of starting with those universal concepts in developing bits? Like once you find something universal, you know that more people can laugh at it. So you're trying to take those things and make funny out of them because more people will get it. Uh, I think the the short answer to this one is no. Uh, oh, the long answer is n- hell no. The long answer is maybe. <laughs> uh, slightly longer. Okay. Um, so one thing that I would say is the way that I'm writing jokes now compared to the way that I was writing jokes like that one about like the five year versus 80 year right. like wedding material. Like that is a joke that I wrote. I think I had been married, but I definitely wasn't. It wasn't about marriage. Like it wasn't about like it wasn't about an emotional thing. It was about something maybe that people had heard about. Yeah. But I wasn't. I was thinking about it. Let me an interlude here. Mitch Hedberg has a joke that I love, uh, where I think this demonstrates something about this kind of thing. Like, do you, you know his joke about how like you ever notice on a traffic light green means go and yellow means yield, but on a banana it's just the opposite. <laughs> yellow. <laughs> means go ahead. Uh, Green means slow down. <laughs> and red means where the fuck did you get that banana at? <laughs> and so that that is a beautiful thing. That's the kind of joke, like if I was doing a podcast with him, uh, which uh, if you could just be Mitch Hebrew for the rest of the podcast, um, <laughs> then I would, like, I feel like that would be like the joke that I would be asking him, like you asked me about the scarecrow joke. Yeah. Like, not like, how did you do that? Beca- beca- but just, I understand that he did, he noticed. That's the thing yeah. that he noticed that in in the world that we all inhabit as far, you know, at least in our culture, traffic lights have these two colors and bananas have these same two colors. There's nothing connecting them other than he found that connection. Right. He didn't, he didn't create it. He discovered it. And then he added something to it with the, the red banana because like that, you know, <laughs> a, a fun like rule of three that got added in, like it's a, it's a beautiful joke yeah. that began with this discovery where I feel like sometimes, and maybe all jokes are discovery in some sense because we didn't create the world, but s- some jokes are more like creating something. So the, the joke that I have about, you know, noting that really it is like oak and granite, those are the things uh, that you get when you're old. And also that is what I think tombstones and coffins are made of. That yeah. is the connection that I, that I also, I'm like, oh, that what a gift that, that is, that the, yeah. Somebody who came up with that system, like, left for me years and years ago. And it was such a gift that you had to preface it by saying, this is really true. Yeah. And I looked it up to make sure. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, that would be the kind of thing that if, like, if I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to lie about it because then I feel like the, the joke isn't as good. I mean, it would be a different yeah. thing. Be like, what if it was this? Like, yeah. it's not as powerful as it is this. Though yeah. there are plenty of great what if jokes. But so the, the things that I'm talking about now about, let's say, vows and, uh, and all the the customs of marriage, I'm I'm not delving into them because they're universal. I'm delving into them because they're personal to me now. Because I'm dating someone who I've dated for longer than anyone. We talk about marriage. We are planning to be together for as long as possible. Okay. Like and especially compared to like I have I have older jokes about not really being into marriage despite having been married you know like i did get married i did get divorced like it wasn't like it what you know i was younger i wasn't as experienced in relationships in life in knowing you know like i don't regret any of the those steps because they were hilarious to us (laughs) (laughs) thank you (laughs) thank you thank you i mean and you know in that situation like it was it, it was a learning it was a like both in comedy and in life in relationships like there was learning and experiencing and exploring being done and now like a lot of my new hour is about like the difference between you know younger dumber me and older slightly less dumber me you know that now like and so i'm not i think that i am presenting ideas that are potentially more universal now but again not because of that i'm not starting with them because of that but i have just lived more life now so i have more experiences that 
more people who have lived life yeah. have had. Yeah. Like I'm not like in the beginning, maybe it, it makes more sense to be like, you know, I didn't I didn't have as much life experience. So I'm like, let me look up some uh, materials of the coffins, <laughs> right? Let me like, you know, let me imagine things. It's more what if as opposed to like, this is what has been. Yeah. Uh, so now your personal experiences are also universal. I do think that that's like when I look at people like, you know, I love Mike Birbiglia. Sure. Uh, and he, he has a few hours of comedy about his, you know, marriage, his relationships, his family, yeah. like things that like are in one way unique to him because they're his and in another way are not unique because so many people have marriages, families, children. And so he's not he's not saying like women are like this. He's saying like this is what is a this is my story about yeah. my wife and this is my story about my child. And then like sometimes the personal is the most universal thing because yeah. you're like, oh, he is a human and has these experiences. I am a human that has these experiences. Uh, especially when making broader generalizations, sometimes you'll exclude a lot of people. Yeah. But if you just talk about yourself, then I mean, this is—I'm certainly not reinventing the wheel here. I'm like, hey, uh, any comedians out there? Uh, <laughs> quick tip, life hack: write about yourself uh, from your own perspective, and you might just find that other people have their own lives and selves and perspectives. I'm like, oh, you have one in there too. I have one in here. That, Pretty amazing. And then you're charging three thousand dollars for that comedy seminar thank you so much and then the final question is because you know after marriage you, i mean you had talked about some you know not wanting to have kids and then you say let me finish not not wanting kids at all in this world and i guess i want your current take on my hot take and this is my signature issue that having kids is selfish to the kid because you're subjecting that kid to 80 years of life what uh, is your take on kids now and what do you think about my hot take uh great question i could say a lot about this yeah um I will say that, so the joke, I, I think, I may have done it in multiple uh, forms, but the one joke that you referenced right now, I, the way that I would tell it if I had to tell it now is, I do not want children, let me finish, to exist at all. Yeah. Uh, maybe I don't even say, let me finish, I just pause, whatever it is. It was good. And, and here's the thing is, that was coming from, a, I had just gotten out of a relationship uh, because she wanted several children in the next several years. And at that time, in my early 30s, I did not want that. And we loved each other. And that was that's like a big thing that's kind of important to at least be able to compromise, agree on. And I was like, half a kid? You know what I mean? Like that's <laughs> I, that not like like Solomon, you know, offered. That's I think that's what we should do. You, you want one at least. I want zero. We want three. Okay, one and a half. Fine. Well, split, you know? the, split the kid in half. And uh, so I would... Uh, that that came from that real place like so the in that in that situation like the setup came from my life and my real experience of i do not want to have children like the punchline that i don't want children like that i don't want children to exist that has never been true yeah uh i like there are people like i have many beloved friends who have beloved children beloved to them beloved to me yeah. i'm happy to not be the ones raising them yeah. I'm, I'm happy to visit them, hang out with them. I I'll actually, tell them jokes, make them laugh. I do love performing for children good. sometimes. Like I've, that happens once in a while. I get I, fun jokes out of it. I have a good time. I'd, like, love, to, I'd love to see a scrubbed for children Mike Kaplan set. Uh, Are you going to put out a children's album? Uh, you know, I, I have. Well, here's the thing. An okay. album that you may not have heard because okay. right now it has only been released on Sirius Satellite Radio oh, okay. is an album that I, I called Live In Between Albums. Oh. Uh, so I recorded it in between my last album and this one that's coming out later this year and it is pretty much clean like it's not oh, necessarily yeah. for children right. but it i think if they listen to it they certainly their parents could be like uh i'm okay with this <laughs> okay Par um, parental guidance pg not not g yeah okay. uh yeah I, I wouldn't tell a kid like you should listen to this you know <laughs> uh, but i'd be i'd tell my friend you can listen to this in the car yeah. while your kid is in the backseat good uh, and you don't have to worry uh about you know whatever don't worry but uh i do I, I am now in a place, I feel like the place that you are where you're like selfish to the kid, subjecting them to, I mean, 80 years, that's optimistic even. Yeah, uh, that's, like, that's worst case scenario, the yeah. fact that they're going to have to be working for 80 years of their life. And I mean, I feel like that question sort of reveals something about sure. your, yourself <laughs> sure. uh, and how how you are, I mean, uh, one one aspect of how you view life uh, yeah. as a prison, uh, as a, I mean, and you're you're allowed to leave. I don't I don't want you to. I want, I'm happy that you're here. I, I want you to, uh, to... 
I, I want you to learn. I, I want you to enjoy. I want you to enjoy life. That's what yeah, I want. That's for what you. you always say at the end of your set. Like you know, everybody here enjoy life until the death. Day, yeah. So, yeah, until death. Until yeah. death, and sometimes I say and beyond. Like yeah. I want, I want, I'm happy. I'd be happy for you to continue. I mean, I guess you don't enjoy your life after your life, but I'm like enjoy life, enjoy death, yeah. like enjoy all that you just enjoy. Yeah, uh, I, I enjoy it, but it just it, it comes with a certain set of obligations that will last for 80 years after you know even the most even the best parents will take care of you and pamper you and, and get you ready for those first 20 years maybe if that and then send you out in the world so you, you go out there and kind of you know learn the world yourself and so even with the best parents and the best upbringing you are going out there and having to work for 80 years until you die so uh, i mean do you think it's selfish i mean it, it doesn't matter but do you think it's selfish i mean i would not say that it is selfish in that way or necessarily in any i think that different people have children for different reasons different people like care for their children and set their children up for potentially success oh, or sure. otherwise in sure. various ways and so i'm at a place now where i used to be like let's say i'm like i don't know what happens uh after i die because that hasn't happened yet or i don't know about it if it did what like, what, what are jewish ta- i mean like you know I, I know you're you know you had a little you you referenced you know somebody saying jews, jews go to hell where do jews go in the afterlife as taught by the jewish religion i, uh, I, have, I have no fucking clue um, I also don't, I know only a little more than you. I don't okay. believe we have a hell though, you know, depending on like the, the particular subset of Judaism, like there might be different ideas, rules governing, but I can tell you that I think that if the more you think about hell during life, like the more hellish your life is, well, that's true. um, and you know, the more you endeavor to make this world as heavenly as possible for others and yourself, you know, that the more heavenly this world hopefully is can be and I don't like I've been engaging with some uh, Buddhism recently like a friend of mine teaches a class that I've been taking or auditing and like you know there's all kinds of beliefs and ultimately I do think now in some ways it doesn't matter like not to say it doesn't matter like do whatever you want but it like regardless of what happens like the thing to do in life is to like care for yourself and others as much as possible yeah and I I would say that I used to worry. I'm like, what if you bring a, a human being? What if you bring a new consciousness into the world and without knowing? You don't even you haven't seen the end of the movie, right? Yeah. So you're like, oh, I think this will be even if your life has been great. Like eventually, like right now, my grandmother is 91. She's in the hospital. Like she's per- perhaps she'll come out of the hospital like without the pneumonia that we found in the hospital. Perhaps the congestive heart failure uh, will be treated in ways. Perhaps diet and physical therapy will help with it. There's a lot of things happening, and she's certainly not going to ever not be a 90-something-year-old person. I mean, yeah. may- maybe she'll be 100, but it's possible. Like, who knows? Like, we're never... Nobody's guaranteed anything. She's lived 91 years already. She yeah. got that. And, like, we... I, I wondered, I used to, I used to worry, like, uh, before I did a lot of psychedelics, I used to worry <laughs> more about, like, what, what if I'm wrong and, like, there is potential, like, eternal suffering? Like, and that, and uh, again, I don't, I don't claim to have any, you know, objective, you know, answer to whether there is or isn't or how anything like that might work. But I am, I, the thing that I am confident in now is, like, all of, like Alan Watts said, that we don't come into the world, we come out of it. Like everything that any human is made of existed before. Yeah. Like the the matter, the energy, like you you didn't just pop into existence. You were, you know, the, if the Big Bang was everything and then boom and, you know, or, or bang. And then there, there it goes and it's on its way and, you know, stars are exploding and then eventually, like who, like it is... In a way, objectively miraculous. It's not like the uh, the like sometimes some part of the miracle is gross and uh, and painful, uh, but some of it's you know beautiful and and pleasurable, and uh, the idea that like that you could br- that the idea of bringing a new life into the world doesn't isn't even doesn't make as much sense to me now because it's not. It's in some ways new. It's a new configuration. Like uh, okay. these molecules didn't go together until now, and now yeah. it's oh wow, a person. What a, a per- that's connected to me. Like I I get it. I get it more now, especially because I mean I don't know what's going to happen in this life. I don't know what's going to happen with climate change, with uh, you know authoritarianism, with fascism, with you know white supremacy, with all the things that you know are potentially uh, challenging and troubling these days. Like bringing a child into. The, I think there's yeah. plenty of reasons. 
uh, to think like the same way, you know, think before you birth a joke into the world yeah. about what effects the, that joke might have on people uh, and then what reactions those people might have that might have effects on yourself. Again, not to, not to be controlled by it. But yeah. similarly, like there are some people who are like, you know, aren't thinking about anything. And they're like, oh, we, we're having a kid. We some accidentally had the kid. And then some people are thinking about it extensively. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, I still, I want to, and I think it'll be good. And like, none of us do know the future. Um, but I am, I am optimistic that uh, there is a part of life that is a gift. Uh, that like, there are things that I enjoy in life and that eventually, like, Everything will be, you know, this this body won't exist in this form, right. uh, even moment to moment, but certainly after uh, some number of <laughs> days, weeks, months, years, decades, centuries, I don't, yeah. know, say. <laughs> uh, I don't know the future. I'm, he, uh, he's, he's vegan. I'm going to go for centuries. He's vegan. Uh, yeah. Um, I actually don't like to tell people that. Um, <laughs> that just gives them more fuel for their fire. But uh, the, yeah, so I, I know that I'm pretty optimistic that... <laughs> That I'll stop being and won't be burning in eternal flame. Yeah, uh, I'm like I'm pretty optimistic about that. And, and you're optimistic for the kids too, because it sounds that's, like that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that, it's of the yeah. world anyway. It's not like you're birthing something new. The matter was here anyway. You got it. So you're just giving it new form. Yeah, just and, yeah. And the callback was to you know we should think before we have kids. We should think before we tell provocative jokes. And like a good Mike Kaplan set, you brought us full circle. I did. And so when people want to hear the next full circle, that is Mike Kaplan. All killing aside, in May, everywhere great comedy's found. I appreciate it. Oh, cool. Mike Kaplan, thank you so much. Thank you.